let's talk about two of the most practically applicable consequences of general relativity, gravitational redshift and gravitational time dilation. We'll begin by imagining the scenario of a rocket ship that's in deep space, far away from any masses or any energy that would give rise to gravity or space-time curvature. Suppose this rocket ship is accelerating upwards at a constant acceleration of g. We'll assume that at time zero, the rocket represents an instantaneous inertial reference frame r, so its velocity at time zero is zero relative to r. Obviously, the velocity of an inertial reference frame relative to itself is zero. Let's say that this rocket ship has a source at the bottom which fires an electromagnetic wave at an angular frequency omega naught relative to r. We'll also suppose that there's an observer at the top of this rocket ship located a distance h above the source who's going to receive these wave signals from the source. Now recall that the equivalence principle is the foundation of general relativity, and according to the equivalence principle, the observations of someone inside this uniformly accelerating rocket ship are equivalent to the observations of someone in a uniform gravitational field. So if I draw a uniform gravitational field with the source at the bottom and a receiver at a distance h above the source, the observations made by this gravitational field observer are equivalent to the observations made by the observer in the accelerating rocket ship. This means if I analyze the frequency change measured by my rocket observer for the electromagnetic wave, that analysis will also hold true for the observer in the uniform gravitational field. That's the equivalence principle. So let's derive the equation for gravitational redshift by looking at this first scenario, the scenario of the accelerating rocket. Again, in this scenario, which I'll copy-paste here, we have a source emitting electromagnetic waves at a frequency omega naught, according to that source. The speed of those waves is the speed of light c, so the time it takes for that wave to reach my observer is t1, which is just h over c. Now, in actual fact, the time t1 is slightly higher than h over c because by that moment in time, the observer has actually moved up an additional distance of half g t1 squared. However, we're going to assume that this half g t1 squared distance is very small compared to h over c and that it makes no difference because light travels so quickly that the receiving observer barely has any time to move up before the wave has already reached him. So h over c is the time it takes for the receiver to receive the electromagnetic wave when it was initially emitted from the source at time zero. But by this time, the receiver has gained a new velocity of g times t1, which would just be gh over c. At this point, the receiver can be thought of as being in his own instantaneous inertial reference frame r prime. The source, which started off as stationary in the reference frame r, has emitted an electromagnetic wave directly towards him while he is moving away from that source at an instantaneous velocity of gh over c. And in order to determine the frequency omega the receiver perceives for the electromagnetic wave, we just need to use the relativistic Doppler effect. Recall from my video on the relativistic Doppler effect that if an electromagnetic wave is emitted with a frequency omega naught in the original source's reference frame, then the frequency omega measured by a receiver who is traveling in the same direction, the same axis as the electromagnetic wave, this frequency omega is given by the following equation. This is just the equation for the longitudinal Doppler effect for light that applies when the receiver is traveling away from the source, which happens to be the case here. My source started off at rest in the instantaneous reference frame R, and by the time my light or EM wave reaches the receiver, the receiver is moving away from the source at a relative velocity V, which in this case is GH over C. If I now tailor expand the square root term around V equals zero, this is what I'll get. And this is where I'll make my next assumption. I'll assume that V is so small relative to C that these higher power terms can be ignored. When I do that, my equation for the Doppler effect becomes the following. And when I plug in my V as GH over C, this is what I get. So this is the equation for the frequency omega of the electromagnetic wave that was perceived by my receiver who's above the source and was accelerating in the upwards direction. You'll notice that omega is obviously less than omega naught, which suggests that my receiver at the top of the rocket ship perceives that the electromagnetic wave has been redshifted compared to how it started from the source. And because of the equivalence principle, I can then conclude that in a uniform gravitational field, a receiver that is higher up in the gravitational field perceives the same effect. That is, signals that are emitted from the surface of the gravitational field are redshifted or shifted to a lower frequency compared to how they started off. This phenomenon is known as gravitational redshift, and this equation is the mathematical relationship describing this gravitational redshift. 
Let's move on to gravitational time dilation, whose equation is pretty easy to derive now that we've got our equation for gravitational redshift. If we take our gravitational redshift equation and write our angular frequencies in terms of the corresponding period of the wave, capital T and capital T naught respectively, then this is what we get. If I rearrange things in this equation and write everything in terms of capital T, this will be my answer. So the time interval between two events, in this case between two successive peaks of the electromagnetic wave, so the period of that wave, that time interval is dilated as we move higher in the gravitational field. This is the effect of gravitational time dilation. I'll call this equation 1. Again, gravitational time dilation means that a clock that might tick 5 seconds on the surface of a gravitational field is slower compared to a clock higher up in the gravitational field, which might tick by more than 5 seconds. That is, when we go further away from a gravitational field, clocks run faster. And this principle doesn't just apply to signals of a wave, it applies to any two events. So if you have someone on Earth that's aged by 10 years, that person's twin who's just sitting far away in deep space will have aged by slightly more than 10 years because of gravitational time dilation. Similarly, your head is aged slightly more than your foot because of gravitational time dilation. Granted, the effect is really small because if you're 1.75 meters, for instance, then in Earth's gravitational field, this factor in the denominator is really close to 1, but the effect is still there nonetheless. Now, there's also an alternative derivation of gravitational redshift and time dilation. Suppose again that I have this accelerating rocket, but now my source is at the top of the rocket and my receiver is at the bottom. They're both still separated by the vertical separation h, and their source still fires EM waves at an angular frequency omega naught in its own rest frame. Again, suppose that in this case, the instantaneous reference frame of the source is r at time zero, and the velocity of the rocket ship is zero according to r, obviously. When the source fires the EM wave, the EM wave reaches the receiver at time t1, which is once again h over c. Again, in actual fact, the time t1 is slightly smaller than h over c because by that moment in time, the observer has moved up an additional distance of half gt1 squared. But once more, we're going to ignore the small distance with assumption 1. But by this time, the receiver has gained a new velocity of g times t1, which would just be gh over c again. At this point, the receiver is now in his own instantaneous inertial reference frame R prime. The source, which started off as stationary in the reference frame R, has emitted an electromagnetic wave directly towards him while he is moving towards that source at an instantaneous velocity of gh over c. And in order to determine the frequency omega the receiver perceives for the electromagnetic wave, we once again use the relativistic Doppler effect. This time, however, we use the Doppler effect for an EM wave that's traveling in the opposite direction as my receiver. So my receiver is traveling in the same axis as the wave, but towards it, not running away from it. In this case, the equation for the longitudinal Doppler effect is as follows. If I now Taylor expand the square root term around V equals zero, this is what I get. Again, I'll use assumption two to ignore higher power terms involving V, and when I do that, my equation for the Doppler effect becomes the following. And when I plug in my V as GH over C, this is what I get. Now this time when my receiver is at the bottom and source is at the top, the frequency of the EM wave perceived by my receiver is greater than omega naught, which suggests that my receiver at the bottom of the rocket ship perceives that the electromagnetic wave has been blue shifted compared to how it started from the source. And because of the equivalence principle, I can then conclude that in a uniform gravitational field, a receiver that is lower down in the gravitational field perceives the same effect. That is, signals that are emitted from higher up are blue shifted shifted or shifted to a higher frequency compared to how they started off. This is another equation for gravitational redshift or blue shift in this case. And then by a similar logic, the equation for gravitational time dilation becomes the following, where capital T is the time interval perceived by my receiver who's lower down, and capital T naught is the time interval perceived by someone who's higher up. This is just another way of expressing gravitational time dilation. I'll call this equation 2. Now the issue here is that equations 1 and 2 kind of contradict each other. Let me explain. Suppose that I have a uniform gravitational field and I've got someone on the ground and someone up here, a distance h above the ground. If my ground observer A has time Ta elapse on his clock, then an observer B who's above A will have a corresponding time Tb elapse on his clock. According to equation 1, Tb is related to Ta by the following. But then, according to equation 2, Ta is related to Tb by the following. 
If we then plug in TA back into equation 1, we get this expression. But this is obviously not true. TB has to equal itself, and it kind of does, approximately, as long as you assume that GH over C squared whole squared is really small. But you can't always make that assumption. And this contradiction arises from assumption 1 that we made earlier, that the light catches up to the accelerating receiver well before the receiver really moves that much, so the half GT squared term gets neglected. And that term corresponds to the GH over C squared whole squared term. If light took a long time to reach the receiver, which can occur if the distance H is large, then you can't exactly ignore the half GT squared term. So in the last part of this video, I'm going to give you a more exact derivation of gravitational time dilation for a uniform gravitational field without relying heavily on assumption 1, which will let me work with large values of h instead of just the small values permitted by equations 1 and 2. Suppose again that I have a uniform gravitational field g, and that I want to calculate the relationship between the time interval on the ground tau naught and the corresponding time interval at a large distance h above the ground, tau sub h. To calculate this, we'll divide the height h into n segments of an infinitesimally small length dy. Because dy is really small, we can actually use equation 1 or equation 2 to describe the relationship between tau at height 0, or tau 0, and the tau at height dy. I've used equation 2 in this case. Similarly, the gravitational time dilation relationship between the time at height dy and the time interval at height 2 dy is the following. When I plug in the tau at height dy in terms of tau naught, this is what I get. You've probably noticed a pattern here. If we go up all the way to the height h, you can show that the time interval at height h, which is just n times dy, is related to tau naught by the following equation. If we now take the limit of this as n approaches infinity, you get the exponential of gh over c squared as your time dilation factor. I'll call this equation 3. Now, even if I used equation 1 in my derivation, where my tau at dy would be related to tau naught by this expression, I would still get the same answer in the end with my limit. So equation 3 is a more consistent and more exact expression for the gravitational time dilation in a uniform gravitational field. The time interval observed on the surface is slower compared to the time interval far away from the surface in a uniform gravitational field. Now, actual gravitational fields or space-time configurations, remember gravity is the curvature of space-time, aren't uniform, so they have their own separate equations for gravitational time dilation. But we'll get to those equations when we talk about the solutions to the Einstein field equations, and introducing the Einstein field equations will be a topic for the next video. I'd like to thank the following patrons for their support, and if you enjoyed the lesson, feel free to like and subscribe. This is the Faculty of Khan, signing out.